You see, God didn't just inspire every word. He inspired the message that those words collectively make. And so this morning, the backdrop that God gives us in this new chapter is, is the doctrine of inspiration teaching us that every part of this book God designed for us. And this, this book of Revelation, every part of it is supposed to be a blessing. That's what chapter 1, verse 3 says. Those that read and hear and hold on to the truth that's in this book are blessed by God himself. So what is the blessing? Well, though we have packaged the Bible over the years, now you know, if, if uh, Daniel or Ezra or Nehemiah would have seen us walking around and saying this is the word of God, they would have looked at it to try and figure out what we're talking about because theirs was packaged in scrolls. And they would have wondered what this little flat thing, and especially, you know, you get one with pictures and lights and everything else, you know, they would have really wondered about that. But though we have packaged the Bible over the years, translating the original Hebrew and Greek into our language, putting covers on in the 12th century, the Bishop of Canter Archbishop of Canterbury added the chapter divisions. By the time we get to the 16th century, a printer in Geneva, fleeing to Geneva, put in the verse divisions, although all of those have been added in the packaging, the content is from God. That, that's what the doctrine of inspiration is, that God sent every word of this book to us. And that is an amazing blessing. So think about it. Though the horrors that we read about in chapter 6 were all placed in chapter 6 by God. It's not like uh, that John got this big box, kind of cosmic scrapbooking, you know, that he could just go through and arrange everything and put it anywhere he wanted and, and kind of make this kind of scrapbook for us of everything God's going to do. No, God took him on a divinely guided tour. And God showed him exactly in order what he wanted us to know, to be blessed. And so, the loss of life. If, if you read chapter 6, you remember when we covered it, more people die in chapter 6 than have ever died in any event in human history. Now, the flood of Noah, which killed everybody but eight people, you know, the, the people that study uh, human population growth, they factored in the size of family, the length of life, and childbearing years that are reflected in Genesis uh, chapter 6 through 8 and prior, and there could have been as many as one billion people that died in the flood of Noah. But that's nothing compared to the almost two that will die in chapter 6. So this is the greatest extinction level event, the greatest single largest loss of human life ever recorded. But not only did God design that contrast, which that happens just before chapter 7. Secondly, God designed all the events that are written in the book of Revelation. Take the thought a step further. The order of events written down in Revelation were exactly engineered by God. It's an eyewitness guided by God, written by John, tour of the future. It wasn't self-guided. It isn't John thinking this up. In fact, my son, who got home yesterday, was on a flight somewhere, and he was sitting next to a man from India who was a Muslim who was, you know, my son just came back from a short-term mission trip, and he was witnessing to this fellow next to him. And the man says, when, when Joseph quoted from a certain passage, the man says, no, 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 that's not from God. That's just a human thought that up. No, 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 no. No, no, that was just a prophet or something. That wasn't from God. That's, that's not how, this isn't like David sat up and thought up these songs, and it's not like that Luke decided one day he would write this clever biography. The doctrine of inspiration is that, that God guided it all, and especially when we get to Revelation, this is a God-given tour for us of the future. We didn't think this up. John didn't think this up. God sent it the way it comes. And so, Revelation from 4 onward, John is taken by God to heaven, and like a reporter sent to a news scene, John is guided around the scenes of heaven and on earth, and God told him exactly what to write. And by the way, by the time we get to chapter 10, God tells him what he can't write. In chapter 10, God says, nope, you, nope, nope, don't record that, don't record, don't put down what just was said, nope. See, this was engineered by God, and it's a wonderful thought that God designed this book. Well, now, look at chapter 7, because this is an amazing chapter. 
As we arrive at chapter 7, I want to first show you, remember the richness? I told you that the revelation God designed to be a blessing. You want to know how it can be a blessing? One of the greatest ways it can be a blessing is to learn the doctrines that are taught in this book. Now, you know, most people, um, have you ever met a worrier, you know, a person that's anxious, they're anxious about the weather and they're anxious about everything that could or possibly ever happen, you know, they're just nervous. Do you know when you meet a person that's anxious and worry, kind of a worry wart. Do you know what you've met? Someone that's a good meditator. They can really meditate. They think deeply. They just think deeply on the wrong stuff. You know, it, it's, they're, they're thinking about all the problems and all the potential disasters and everything that, you know, probably could happen, and so they don't even want to go out of the house because it might happen. Did you know what God wants us to do? Not to meditate on all of our potential problems, but to meditate on his promises and the truths of his word, which are called doctrines. These are teachings from God. And when you, when you take that mind that is so good at working through stuff, and instead of working on stuff that is worthless, that will never profit, worry and anxiety never does, start using that skill on truth, on doctrine. So what are some doctrines? Let me just take you through this, okay? We'll do a quick, this is the index of the chapter. Number one, first doctrine, God's complete control of timing. That's the doctrine of omniscience. Remember I told you that this whole book, Jesus tells John, I'm going to show you the things that are going to happen in the future, the things that are going to happen after this in the future. Now wait a minute. Nobody predicts the future. Did you know none of the major world religions, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, the, none of the major books of religion have prophecy. It's the missing element in all the world religions except for the true and living God of the universe. He stakes his name. He says, I'm the Lord, and the way that you know I'm the Lord is, I can tell you what's going to happen in the future, and the way I say is how it will happen. How come? Because God makes it happen. He watches over his word and he causes it to happen. So the first thing is the doctrine of God's omniscience. He knows exactly what will happen forever, both past, both present, and future. God inhabits eternity and is the one that's unfurling the, the panorama of time because he's above it and he's the author of all that exists. So that's the first doctrine. Second one is, I mean, they get even more amazing. God's awesome power. The second part of verse 1 talks about God's awesome power over nature. That's the doctrine of his omnipotence. God holds absolute power. Did you know there's this huge engine of our meteorological, hydrological, the whole cycle of how water is in the ocean, evaporates, and it rises, and that whole rising causes weather disturbance, and then it comes up, and it cools down, it condenses, and then it rains again. And that whole hydrological cycle with the atmospheric engine behind it is one of the single more powerful things on this planet. And God steps in at the end of verse 1 and goes, boop, stop, puts the pause button. It's impossible to stop that. There's so much energy, so much kinetic and static and every other form of, of amazing power. And God just pauses it. That is his omnipotence. We're going to talk about that for a moment. The third doctrine, which is equally amazing, is his ownership of his bond slaves. In chapter two, or chapter seven, verses two and three, we see the doctrine of salvation. God chooses those he calls, and those that are chosen and called, he seals and fills, and he uses them. And by the way, God calls them, the 144,000 ethnic Jews from each of the tribes, and us, bond servants. Now, what's real interesting, 500 years ago, the Reformers, both Luther and Calvin, when they were working on the translation of the Bible into the language of the people that were in their churches, they shied away from the word doulos because they said it's just socially unacceptable to call someone a slave. I mean, slavery had a bad name 500 years ago, not just, you know, 150 years ago in America. It's always had a bad name because the absolute ownership of a human by another is just distasteful to humans. We want total independence. But God says, I bought you so that you are my slave forever. Only I bind you not with shackles, but with the cords or the bonds of love. So you obey me because you love me. And those that love me keep my commandments. See, 
but we're called bond slaves, absolutely doing the will of another, and we're going to see that doctrine in this book. Here's the fourth doctrine, God's specific plan to use his people. If you read chapter 7, verses 4 through 8, you see a beautiful picture of the doctrine of election, and that is that God created us for a purpose to serve and glorify him. He has specific plans for us, and we follow them by choice. We are called and convicted and chosen by him and moved to salvation, and at that point, we respond. And you know, when I leave work many days, somebody, let's see, I think it's that direction, out in the back, you know, between us and the soccer fields, we have a big field out there, and they're always running their model, electronically controlled drones, you know, that's a popular word, their little model aircraft. And boy, they're Every time I see them, they get bigger. They have amazing, and they're doing all these touches and goes and twirly hoops and runarounds, you know, and they'll strap the building, you know, and they do all kinds of stuff out there. But that little plane can't do anything but what the man with his trunk open with the little control box is doing. That is not what humans are like. We are not drones that just do whatever God wants us to do, and we have no choice. The amazing thing is, Paul, you want to talk about God's power? Paul's riding up to Damascus. Jesus knocks him off his horse. He's laying with his face in the dust. Jesus says, what are you doing? You're persecuting me. And, and Paul looks up, blinded by the sight, sees Jesus Christ. And you know what he says about that? I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Do you know what he said? I responded. You see, we respond. God calls. God elects. God does all that he does. But we have a choice to respond. We are not drones. And these 144,000 choose because they love the Savior that purchased them to obey him. Well, I'm just supposed to read these off. Look at the fifth one, uh, verses 9 and 10. God's love and action for lost sinners. Remember the great contrast? When the earth is at its darkest hour, God sends the, the most potent missionary evangelistic group ever to be on the planet. 144,000. And that's the doctrine of God as Savior. God loves, God seeks, and God saves lost sinners. And at the darkest, most horrific hour of human history, God sends these in. And it's amazing when we look at the details in a few moments of what they do. By the way, God identifies himself as God the Savior. In fact, if you read the book of Titus, over and over it's called God the Savior. God the Savior. God is a Savior. Yes, Jesus Christ is our Savior, but that's because he is God the Son, and God himself is a Savior. That is a characteristic of his person. Well, the, the next doctrine we get is number six, and, and it's in verses 11 and 12, and it's the doctrine of God's desire for the worship of his people. That's the doctrine of God's glory. God seeks our worship. Remember Jesus said that to the woman at the well in Samaria in John 4. The Father seeks our worship. He inhabits our worship. That means that the more worship we offer, it's, it's just like God is just, just wants to follow that cloud of fragrant offering, and he just, he just enjoys our worship. That's why he created us, and he wants everything we do as his bond slaves and everything we think and everything we say to rise up as glory. See, worshiping God is bringing him glory, bringing him the glory that is due him as creator and as immeasurable, infinite, almighty one. And the last doctrine that's in this chapter, didn't I tell you that this is one of the most amazing books in the Bible? This is like a compendium of the best of the best of the best. And this is just chapter 7, which is a kind of a boring chapter by a lot of people's standards. I mean, all this, you know, 12 tribes of this and that, it's just kind of boring. This is like the Comstock load of doctrine in the Bible. And the seventh one is God's eternal plans for those who he saves, who are his bond slaves. And that's 15, 16, and 17. And it's the doctrine of rewards. Everything we do on earth is either good for God's glory or it's worthless forever. You know, I, I read all the time, because I, I have many 
friends in business and they're always sending me, you know, the Harvard this review and the Wall Street that review and the Bloomberg this and whatever. And, you know, a lot of great principles. And, and, and I love it all and I read all that stuff. But I see this underlying, you know, you need to have this one and three and five and 10 and 20 year plan and you really got to get set for when you're 50 and 55 and 60 and 65 and whatever. And, and, you know, those are all great. So they're kind of like plans for the next 50 or 70 years. Why don't we plan for the next 50 or 70,000 years? Ever thought about that? You ever thought about what this decision I'm making in this car or this investment, what good will that be in 50,000 years? See, that's what bond servants of God think about. They don't think, mm, I need a Telsa. You know, I want to drive a $100,000 car. Good, drive it. It's the safest car. Highest rankings of any car ever made. Will it make a difference in 50,000 years? Or would the 100000 be better spent other ways. See, that's the mindset of a servant of God. I was just supposed to read that and I was supposed to preach. Now I can start preaching on them. Okay, now we're going to read through the text. So look in chapter 7 and because it's going to take the rest of the hour to read this, you don't have to stand. Okay, just read along in your Bible. Here we go, starting in verse 1. First note with me as I read the first part of verse 1, God's complete control of timing. After these things I saw. You say, huh? Well, remember, God is taking John on a guided tour, and he is showing him things exactly in the order that God wants him to see them. Now, think about the implications of this. Almighty God is narrating the future for John to give to us. He is allowing John to see the future as it happens before God. See, we have to understand that all events in the universe happen right in front of God. There is no corner you know, in all the science fiction, you know, they're, they're able to hide behind this moon and, you know, they can hide in this place and the, the cruisers can't get them, you know. No one can hide from God. It's all happening right in front of him. Nothing escapes his notice. It hasn't yet happened, but to God it's happening all at once. See, John wasn't seeing what will happen. John was seeing what was happening. See, that's the mystery of all this. When you step into God's presence, you can see things happening. In fact, you can see everything happening. You can see the beginning and you can see the end. And most of it hasn't even happened yet. But God sees it all because he's not in time like we are. And he is, he is infinitely above and immeasurably more powerful than everything we see. And so, basically, Revelation is written from the perspective of Isaiah 40. Remember that great chapter that ends with those that wait upon the Lord mount up with wings like eagles? Well, the rest of the chapter talks about God omnisciently seated above and beyond and over all of time and space. He is the sovereign almighty God who knows everything. That is God's omniscience. And nothing shocks, surprises, or slips by the incomprehensibly powerful and all-knowing God. And that's God's complete control of timing. Do you have anything you're waiting on right now? You're hoping to get a little email or, you know, a little, a little uh, text message about maybe some medical test you got or some application you made or you're waiting on financing for this or that scholarship or that grant or you're waiting for this or that and you're just wondering what's going to be the word. God already knows. In fact, he knew before you knew you needed it. He knew what you needed and he knew what the answer was going to be. See, that's the staggering truth as we mature and the blessing. Because if we apply this truth, here's the blessing. When we pray, God already knows what is best, what he wants us to trust him about, how we should follow him, and how we should allow him to have his way. In fact, there's an old-time preacher. He used to be the editor of Eternity Magazine. His name was Donald Gray Barnhouse, 10th Presbyterian, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And you know what Barnhouse, I mean, he used to shock people. He was a tremendous Bible teacher. He'd say, prayer changes nothing but me. People thought, oh, back to the drone thing, you know, that, that we have no choice. No, no. When I pray, I am seeking to get synced with and orchestrated and online and in tune with and, and in step with God who's doing everything perfectly, who knows everything perfectly. It's me who's imperfect, not God. This is not an infomercial when I pray, kind of catching him up. 
and getting him, you know, tuned up with my needs. No, no, he wants to tune me up with his plan, which he knew before my needs arose. See, that's, that's the, the amazing truth that Revelation teaches us. Now, let's go to the second half of verse 1. Look at what happens in verse 1. Four angels, remember it says, and, and I saw, what do you see? The second half of the verse, four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that stillness? You couldn't because it's never happened. Since God began this globe at the rotational speed that it has revolving around the sun, he set in motion the hydrological and the meteorological and the entire system that keeps this planet habitable. But he stopped, he pauses it. Did you know, when we understand what's going on here, it should have the same effect it had on the disciples. Do you remember you read in chapter 14 of Matthew's gospel that Jesus, you know, fed the 5,000 and then the people wanted to make him king and so he sent away the crowds and then he sent his disciples, said, get in the boat, go to the other side, I'll catch up with you, don't worry about me. And he sent them out, it says, before 6 p.m. So about 5.30, they get in the boat, start sailing, the crowds leave, happy and full. Jesus climbs up on the mountain and the disciples get just off from the shore and a huge storm comes. At 6 p.m., the storm comes. At 3 a.m., Jesus, actually it says after 3 a.m., how many hours from 6 to 3? Nine. For nine hours, Jesus is watching them. It says that the Sea of Galilee is boiling, kind of like jacuzzi, you know, it says that the disciples, it's an interesting word, kradzo, they're screaming. Kind of like when someone screams bloody murder. You know, they scream, they're scared to death, they're shrieking. The disciples all thought they were dying. They thought they were drowning. They thought the boat was sinking. They thought they were paddling for all they were worth and they were getting nowhere. And water, they were bailing. The ones who weren't paddling were bailing. And they were just screaming and crying. And Jesus watched that for nine hours. Screaming. I bet their blood pressure was high. <laughs> you, you understand what they're going through? This is trauma. And he was watching. And he was keeping them from sinking. And he was keeping the storm from tipping the boat over. He was keeping them from having a heart attack. You know what I mean? He was watching. But he didn't take away the storm until 3 a.m. And he walks up and he stops it. And it says that the water became just flat. You rarely see that, maybe early in the morning or right at dusk, it's just flat, like a mirror. And the wind stopped, but the water stopped too. And even that, to, to still the whole Sea of Galilee that is 12 by 6 miles, 72 square miles of water, that's amazing. And you know what they did? They all just forgot about bailing the water and they just fell down. And they just said, Peter put it into words, he says, oh, we shouldn't even be in your presence. Who is this that can still the air and the water? Well, that's what this chapter is about. Can you imagine? Jesus demonstrated his power as creator over nature, calming the, the sea, walking on the water, even the darkness at the cross. Nothing stands in his way. Nothing is greater than our God. He has awesome power over the things that we think are the most powerful, and he is more powerful than that. So what's the lesson? Well, if he stills the storm in your life, praise him. If he doesn't still the storm in your life, for nine hours, they scared to death. Trust him. See, he just wanted them to grow in their awesome worship of who he was and their absolute dependence. They couldn't even get across the lake without him. And he wanted them to know it. And he wants us to know the same. But let's continue. Look at the third wonderful doctrine, starting in verse 2. This is God's amazing ownership, and it says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. That should ring a bell. 
When you get to chapter 13, the Antichrist is sealing people on their foreheads and hands. And it doesn't matter if it's an implanted chip or it's a barcode or if it's a tattoo. It doesn't matter. The, the Bible isn't written for us to speculate and avoid getting it, you know. It was written to tell us God seals his own. Did you know this is not new? This is all the way through the Bible. When Israel was being destroyed by the Babylonians, think of special forces and think of an entire army of special forces and that was King Nebuchadnezzar's army that was just conquering the world as fast as he could conquer it and they surround and besiege Jerusalem and they made the perimeter so no one could come or go and they ran out of water and ran out of food and they're dying of starvation and finally when they were too weak to even shoot an arrow they knock the wall down they come in and they start just killing randomly well not randomly systematically just killing everybody inside the city you know in Ezekiel, when that scene is happening, God says, wait just a minute, I want to show you so you really know what I'm doing. He sent a similar angel with the same seal deal, and that angel is going around and marking the foreheads of everybody that mourns for sin and fears God. That's code for believers. They hate sin. They're mourning that they even sin. They don't like sin. They don't like that they sin, and they hate it, and they love God. That's a believer. And he marked them all. And when Nebuchadnezzar was, his soldiers were coming along, they were going, whack. And they go, no, nope, we're not going to whack that one. They didn't know why they weren't killing that one. They were marked. God marked who he wanted to survive. And the people that survived the Babylonian death march were the ones God wanted to go to preserve his word and preserve Judaism and the lineage for Christ. And they all went to Babylon. And they were believers. See, the ceiling is not new. But what is going on here is God knows who's he's, whom he has chosen. He knows their names. He knows their genealogy. He knows their location. He knows every detail right down to their genetic code because he designed it himself. See, we never are out of touch with God. We might feel it. But from his perspective, he knows everything about us. He owns all humans. First, his creator. But here we see salvation means he owns us in a deeper way. Here God marks out those he saves by sealing them because he bought them at a price. These are believers. All of us, 2 Corinthians 1, 20 to 22 says, all of us have the seal of God. That's why when demons were, you know, the seven sons of Siva in Acts chapter 19. They come up and this guy, this Jewish exorcist was exercising. He says, in the name of Jesus. And they go, we know Jesus and we know Paul and you're not one of them. Boom, and they beat him up. Demons can see who are Christians and who aren't because they can't enter us because we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And this is just such a, a beautiful picture of our salvation. And these people are invulnerable. They, they are, no one can touch them until they're done with what God has for them. Did you know that's the same for us? We go around fearing everything. Did you know it will not come near us until God's appointed time? The Lord has set an appointment. We can't make it come any faster, and we can't slow it down. There's appointed unto us a moment when Jesus is going to come and take us home. I was just praying with one of our couples in the church. Uh, uh, the wife is sitting next to her husband as he's close to the gates of heaven, and, and she said, um, you know, she gave me the update, and I said, you know what, you just mark when you notice that last breath, because just before that, Jesus was there, because he set an appointment with your husband. He's going to walk him through the valley of the shadow of death, and when, when he breathes out his last breath and opens his eyes, it's going to be the first time he sees Christ face to face and becomes like him, and Jesus walks him home. But that event doesn't happen until the moment God planned. It's the same process for each of us who have ever been saved. We've gone through the same process. God sought us, found us, convicts us. We respond in faith. He saves us, seals us by his spirit, makes us his bond servants. These people you're reading about that we're going to see their tribes were all born lost sinners, Jewish lost sinners, every one of them weren't saved when the rapture took place. They're just pagan, lost, unbelieving Jews. And they get convicted, and they are saved, and they're drawn 
and God saves them. And just as God sealed the Jews who believed during the horrific days of the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem and preserved them safely, and the rest perished, so these 144,000 are saved and preserved through the horrors of the tribulation. You know, no demon can get them. God opens the lid and the demons come out. They can't get them. No human can slay them. They are invulnerable. Well, let's go to the next one. Look at verse 4. Look at the specific plans that God has for his people. This is the doctrine of election. Verse 4, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Did you know nobody knows what tribe they're in right now? But God does. He knows that's right down to our DNA. He knows what descent they are. And so he finds, verse 5, of the tribe of Judah. That means that their great, 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 3,500 years ago and more was Judah, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. And 12,000 of those descendants of Judah were sealed. And of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. And the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. And the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. And the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. And the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. And the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Now you're seeing why people don't like this chapter. It's just too hard to read. You know, it's just too, what does that have to do with me? You know, and we only want what does with me. And of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. And the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed, and of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed, and of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Why is all that in there? Well, first, to make it very clear, it's not the church. The church is never called, okay, this section, you're Reubenites, and you're Levites, okay, and you're Danites, you know. Oh, Judah, that's who you guys. No. God was as explicitly as human language could convey it, these are Jews. The church is never called descendants of Reuben, descendants of Naphtali. It's to say, this is Jews. Why? Because God called Abraham to bless all the peoples of the world. God raised up his chosen people of promise, and God gave him the temple and gave him the prophets and gave him the word of God. Every word of this came somehow attached to Jewish people. That's what Romans 2 tells us. Every word of the Bible came to us through, the oracles of God came through the descendants of Abraham. But they didn't do what they were asked to do, other than a few notable ones. Most of them, uh, God wanted the temple to be the place where all the nations heard about him. The Jews said, no, you come in here, we'll stone you guys. You stay out. And we don't want your money either, unless you change it for ours. And then we'll take you. You know, I mean, they just, they just didn't do the way God planned and so we know a few. Joseph told the Egyptians, and Moses, of course. Jonah, now there's the way to be a missionary. Put someone in a whale, drown them until they'll surrender, and then send them to the land. And he reluctantly did what he was told. Uh, I mean, what a, what a sad commentary. Uh, David, I mean, when he wasn't in trouble, he was pretty good. Nehemiah, I mean, he was talking to the king and everything. But most of them didn't. The Jews were to live out the truth of God, and they didn't. But God's plans are never thwarted. He says, I'm going to use you to tell all the nations. And he says, I'm going to just send out, I'm going to pick 144,000, and I'm going to convict them of their sins and draw them to the Messiah. And they're going to, he makes 144,000 Pauls. You know how Paul just turned every city upside down, or right side up, actually? He's got 144,000 of them. And that's the blessing of God's specific plans to use his people. Whether a Jew of the tribulation or a part of Christ's church today, God has a plan. Did you know just as much as one of these 144,000, if they didn't do what God called them to do, would not be accomplishing his plan? Did you know we have just as clear a plan, you and I? Remember the 50,000-year perspective? There's something we're supposed to do on earth nobody else can do. God designed us to do it. And the only way we can do it is to stay in touch with him and walk in the Spirit, and, and pray so he can change us to be conformed to the image of Christ. And so that in 50,000 years, we will be rewarded forever what we did today. But it doesn't end there. It gets very interesting. Look what happens. Look at God's great love in action, starting in verse 9. This is the doctrine of God our Savior. After these things, verse 9, I looked, and behold, a great number, which no one could number, of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. 
and crying with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now skip down to verse 13. Then one of the elders asked me saying, who are those arrayed in white robes? Where'd they come from? Verse 14, I said to him, sir, you know. And he said, so he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is God the Savior at work. Most likely using 144,000 to lead these people to Christ. God is a Savior. God loves the world even when we were sinners. Christ died. While the world enters the final and greatest rebellion, God is seeking out the lost. What amazing love. What an amazing portrait of God's love in action for lost sinners. At the worst time, as the world is disintegrating, as the moon, remember, is blood red, we saw last time, and as the black sackcloth is over the sun, as the first six seals' devastation is wreaked, as countless graves are being dug, how many people? It would be equivalent to 200,000 people an hour are dying continuously around the clock. It's a lot of graves to dig. Think about the, the stench of death. And while that is happening, and while people are hastily digging graves, God sends a river of life-giving voices streaming out across every part of the planet, 144,000 radiant, bold, spirit-filled bond servants of God began the work of telling every creature. In fact, Jesus described this moment in Matthew 24, verse 14. And what he said there is that they are going to go to every inhabited place on earth and they're going to speak to every ethnic group and tell them the gospel. They aren't emailing them. They're not sending them a DVD. They're talking to them. And they go to every human and share the gospel. And this will be the single greatest evangelistic event of all times. God sends out a missionary band that is unstoppable, focused on only one thing. They speak the gospel of redemption and Christ's blood to every person still breathing. I can just see this. I mean, here's this guy digging and he's got his face wrapped in a cloth because he doesn't want to get cholera or whatever, you know, from the, the dead person. And he's digging this grave and all of a sudden this guy comes up and and he's just smiling and radiant. This guy's scared to death and running from death. And he goes, uh, hi. And the guy says, well, here, I'll help you. I mean, and, and he says, you know, this guy is a sinner and, and the wages of sin is death. And you're a sinner too. And he's going, who are you? And he starts telling him about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who died in his place. And that person right there facing death, staring it in the face, can either reject or accept. And the amazing thing is these are so visible that most likely the, the converts are slain as fast as they're saved because these 144,000 are being hunted and hated by the Antichrist. And he sees them stopping and talking to someone and they go, did you listen to him? Did you accept? And the person goes, oh yes, I'm forgiven. Actually, they cut their head off. I mean, that's amazing. Well, it doesn't stop there. Look, it even gets more amazing. Look at verse 11. This is God's desire for worship. It's the doctrine of God's glory. Look at verse 11. And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is the chief end of man. Whether therefore we eat or drink or whatever we do, do it all to the glory of God. And here... We see those who are liberated forever from sin's curse and they are forever grateful. And all glory, laud, and honor is due to our great God and on their faces they humble themselves before the one who saved them from their sins and they worship him. Did you know that's why we were created? See, that's what's going to matter in 50,000 years. How much of our life was lived to the glory of God. And that's a choice we make incrementally all day long the lord says even the way we eat or drink can glorify him you know that's why the little pausing for prayer kind of sets the tone when we bow you wouldn't believe how many witnessing opportunities come from bowing your head and when you raise your head you know as people are looking at you and you say hey 
Do you know who I was talking to? <laughs> Have you ever met him? He's here. Do you see him? I mean, you could just, there's in countless ways, but it doesn't end there. Look at, look at the ending of the chapter, starting in verse 15. This is God's eternal plans for his bond slaves. Doctrine of rewards. Therefore, verse 15, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will dwell among them, and they shall neither hunger any more nor thirst, nor the sun will not strike them, nor any heat. The Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. What, what's going on here? Well, think of the joys. These are to God's bond servants. Now, specifically to those converts of the 144,000 that are building up around the throne, but Secondarily, we're also God's, everyone that's born again is a bondservant. What does God promise them? Number one, endless worship. They are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. You know, the other day, uh, last week, Bonnie and I were invited to this Christian Southern uh, quartet deal in New York, and they took us in, and we were on the front row. I've never been in the front row of a concert in my life. I could see their eyelashes. I mean, it was unbelievably loud, too. And I thought, this is really nice. You know, you're not doing this between someone's hairdo. You know, that's the problem not having, or of having hair. When you don't have hair, no one minds sitting behind me except the glow, you know. But uh, I was sitting, there was nobody in front of me. And I mean, it's just I could feel the music pulsating, you know. Look, at that's this endless worship. They're right in front of the throne of God, and they get to be in the most precious spot in the universe. But it doesn't end there. There's actually seven benefits they have. And he who sits on the throne dwells among them. I mean, can you imagine the Lord's milling in the crowd with us? Endless companionship. That's, God loves us and wants to be with us. Endless satisfaction. They shall neither hunger or thirst anymore. They are never unsatisfied. Talk to some addict who spends all their money, either for alcohol or for chemicals. And, and you know why they spend all their money? Because as soon as the initial rush is over, they need more and they need it soon because it's, e it's evaporating quickly. They're never satisfied. Everything has very short satisfaction span. Here, they're never dissatisfied. There's endless satisfaction, endless protection. Nothing strikes them. No bother. They don't need sunscreen or anything, you know. Endless guidance. The lamb shepherds them. They don't have to worry about tomorrow and making arrangements. Just, just enjoying the creation with the creator. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? Uh, kind of like being in a National Geographic magazine on steroids, you know, just seeing everything and the Lord explaining it in full color. Endless life, living fountains of water, endless comfort, no sadness. You know what? That When I finished this, I thought, you know what they're saying? They're saying, hallelujah, what a Savior. And that's who we have. And to close, we only have two minutes left to do this. Grab your hymn book and turn to number 175 in your hymn book. And I thought we would take our place around the throne. So, yes, yeah, stand up. Let's all stand together with your hymn book. We only have enough time to sing the fourth and the fifth. But what I want you to do with me is imagine that, that you're there and you're like I was last week. I mean, there's nobody in front of you. You can see the Lord so clearly. And this is a little snatch of what it's going to be like. We're going to be saying to the Lord, you're the one who is lifted up. Oh, you're such a Savior. Let's sing to him this morning. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior. On the fifth stanza, we're going to do the hallelujah three times, okay? So you don't even need to, you can even close your eyes and just tell the Lord he's such a great Savior. Here we go, fifth stanza. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring, then anew this song will sing, Alleluia, 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 oh, what a 
Savior. Now, just before I close, if you're not excited to be in the front, in fact, if you're wondering in 50,000 years where you're going to be, maybe you're holding on to the wrong things, at the end of the service, every service here, we always have elders, pastors, and godly Titus II women, and they're here with the Word of God, and they would love to explain to you how you can either begin your walk with the Lord or restart it. And that's why the Lord told us we're supposed to help and tell other people, and they're helpers and tellers. And some people just need someone they can see that will help them get started, knowing and being forgiven, or restart it. And if you need that, it's more important than lunch. Come this way, okay? Let's bow for a word of prayer, and then we'll go. Father in heaven, what a Savior you are, O oh God. Thank you that you are in Christ, reconciling the world to yourself, and you have made us ambassadors of the reconciliation. We can actually go through life pointing people to you, proclaiming that we're owned by you, bought at a great price, and that we are great sinners who have a great Savior. And I pray for any today that have never responded, but they're feeling you're convicting work and your tug on their hearts, that they would not harden their hearts, and while they hear your voice, they would respond. And may all of us start planning for 50,000 years, not just the short, but the long haul, what matters forever. We ask that by your grace and for your glory, and in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.